Rick Collum stood on his patio, looking down at the doormat that read, Be neat, wipe your feet, in big, blocky letters. Right between the A and T of the word neat, there sat a mushy-looking red and white ball, and Rick knew at once that Felix had placed it there. Felix was his cat. He had not named the cat himself. In fact, he had argued that Felix was an extremely cliché name for a cat, but his wife, Melanie, had put her foot down on the matter. He hadn't even wanted a cat in the first place. Melanie had put her foot down on that matter as well. She insisted Felix would be a good practice for the young couple before they had a real baby. A starter kit, she had told him. Think of it like a fuzzy toddler with training wheels. So Rick had caved, and they picked up a kitten from the local shelter, mostly black and white short hair with splotches of blonde fur sprinkled here and there. Rick grew to love the cat, and the cat grew to tolerate Rick. Rick's backyard was heavily wooded. It sat on ten acres of forest land dominated by green evers with an occasional cottonwood scattered like a giant yellow typo against a sea of emerald text. The nearest house was 600 yards down the quiet, scarcely used street that ran past Rick's old Victorian-style home. This all gave Felix plenty of space to prowl about, hunting little animals while pretending he was a jaguar in the jungle, and not just an ordinary kitty. From time to time, he would leave a mouse head or the half-eaten carcass of a sparrow at the patio door. Rick found Felix's fleshy feline offering to be sweet in a grotesque and morbid kind of way. It was almost as if the mutilated little creatures was his cat's way of saying thank you for cleaning the litter box and filling his bowl with fancy feast every day. Whenever Rick would find one of Felix's gifts, he'd let out a deep, here we go again sigh, fetch his work gloves, and dispose of whatever was left of the unfortunate animal in the compost bin. But there was no frustrated sigh from Rick this time and trudging off to the tool shed to grab his gloves barely seemed appropriate because once he realized what he was staring at, his body froze with dread. The mushy-looking red and white ball sitting between the A and T on his doormat was actually a mushy-looking red and white ball with a green iris and a black pupil. Felix had delivered a human eye to the patio door. There were two reasons why Rick Collum was sure the blood-coated eye sitting on his porch had once belonged to a person, the first of which being humans have fairly unique eyes, at least compared to animals that lived in the woods around his home. If Felix had brought back the eye of a dead deer or bobcat or coyote, Rick would have realized immediately that it was not a human's. It might have been the wrong size, or maybe an unnatural color. There were a multitude of tells that could have given this fact away to Rick, and even though he was no wildlife expert, he knew he could spot them. The second reason why he was sure the eye once belonged to a person was because he thought he recognized it. It looked just like Melanie's. And, Rick surmised, the chances were, more than likely, that it was hers. It wouldn't have been hard for Felix to find her corpse during one of his backyard jungle cat prowls, chewing it from her face, and bringing it back to the house. After all, Rick had slit her throat and dragged her body into the woods just two days prior. He believed that his mind had temporarily cracked the day he tossed her down in the snow next to the blue tarped stack of firewood in the backyard and ground the serrated edge of his handsaw across the front of her throat. For Rick, going crazy hadn't been an instantaneous thing. It had taken weeks, perhaps even months for him to reach that point. Sleepless nights dominated by Angst-filled internal dialogues had warped his thoughts. Lurid red daydreams had beaten down his psyche. 
He was as mad as a loon when he murdered his wife, but the moment her blood trickled to the ground, mixing in with a slush like a cherry-flavored snow cone, he felt his sanity miraculously return. He had stood over her dead body that afternoon, fingers shaking not from the chill of the sharp winter air, but from shock. Taken aback with himself, yet remarkably clear-minded for the first time in ages. Minutes later, he was lugging Melanie by her ankles through the forest behind their home. He stopped randomly at a quarter mile into the labyrinth of Christmas trees, left her body at the base of a Douglas fir, and started back towards the house. Now, two days later, she had returned. At least, part of her, anyway. Rick plucked the eyeball up from the porch and walked inside the house. He had never held an eye in his hand before, and he supposed he never would again. It was heavier than he expected, but just as squishy. He made a beeline straight for the kitchen sink, dropped it down the drain, then flicked the switch on the wall. The garbage disposal's blades roared to life. It was a hungry monster that dwelled just beneath the stainless steel basin where Rick sometimes peeled potatoes. It chewed and grinded the eyeball to paste with whirring metal teeth and swallowed it down its crooked plastic neck. He wasn't trying to get rid of the evidence. Rick was well aware that he would not be getting away with his wife's murder. Eventually... Melanie's mother would wonder why her daughter wasn't answering her calls and ask Rick's brother-in-law, who lived only an hour away, to drive down to the house and check on her. Or maybe... It would be that drama queen Jamie Lynch, Melanie's bestie from the office, who had become suspicious first and called the police. It didn't really matter. He had nowhere else to go. He didn't own a passport, and quite frankly, even if he did, he probably wouldn't have tried to flee. He was too tired to run. No. No, Rick was going to pay for his crime. He had accepted that. But he didn't want to be reminded of this fact in his last few days as a free man. All he wanted to do was pet Felix and watch sports on the couch. He flicked off the garbage disposal switch and the monster beneath the sink went to sleep. Rick marched back across the house until he reached the oak-trimmed glass door that opened up to his patio. He tugged at the handle, cracking the door, and icy winter air invited itself into his living room. Rick stepped outside to see if Felix was around, but the kitty was nowhere in sight. He called out his name a couple of times and even contemplated looking for him, but decided to retreat to the warmth of his heated home and make dinner instead. Felix would come back when he was good and ready. Sometimes his jungle prowls lasted all night. Besides, it was getting dark and he had a hankering for spaghetti. The following morning, Rick trudged downstairs in his PJs and brewed some coffee. Once it was hot and ready, he poured himself a cup, stirred in a teaspoon of sugar, then slogged sleepily through the living room as he sipped it. He stopped once he reached the patio door and peered through the glass to see if Felix was waiting on the porch to be let in. He was not. However, he did see something else sitting on the patio. It looked like uncooked bacon, smothered in watery ketchup, and he hoped, as ridiculous as the idea sounded in his head, that it was. Though deep down, he knew this was not the case. Rick opened the door and strode outside to investigate. The wooden porch burned cold against his warm, naked feet. He bent down and picked up the fleshy thing between his finger and thumb. It was part of an ear. A sick feeling crept into his stomach, where it mingled with coffee and last night's spaghetti. Without a moment of hesitation, Rick rushed back inside and trotted into the kitchen, taking care not to spill from his mug, then fed the chunk of ear to the monster that lived beneath the sink. Rick would feed that monster the spaghetti from his stomach as well. <laughs> 
one hot shower, two bouts of vomiting, and three swigs of Pepto-Bismol later. Rick was trekking through the woods trying to find the spot that he had left his wife's body. He needed to see Melanie in order to confirm that it was indeed her body parts that had been turning up at his patio door. He was bundled up in a puffy, North Face jacket that had fit him better when he was 20 pounds heavier. On his head, he wore an ugly knitted cap with an orange puffball at the top, and draped around his face was a Christmas-themed scarf that had cutesy pictures of elves embroidered into it. Mismatched mittens protected his hands from the biting cold, and baggy ski pants sagged awkwardly off of his rear, as if he were auditioning for a part in the stage production of Christmas with the Crips, a holiday trap boy musical. Melanie had purchased most of the clothes he was wearing. When she was alive, Rick rarely had a say when it came to his wardrobe. It had become commonplace for her to lay his outfit for the day on the bed by the time he came out of the shower every morning. Now that she was dead, he realized he'd forgotten how to dress himself, or maybe he just didn't care. What did it matter anyway? Soon enough, he'd be sporting a prison jumpsuit, probably for the rest of his life. The sun was out that morning, shining bright and ironic in the freezing winter snow. The snow crunched loudly beneath his boots, and birds in the trees above his head sang songs about a man who murdered his wife with a handsaw. Rick spotted Melanie's corpse fifty feet ahead of him. She was still lying at the base of the tree exactly like he left her, dead and nearly headless. The closer he got, the more he regretted setting off to find her. He wondered if it would be better or worse to see her face sans eyes or ears or whatever else Felix had managed to gnaw off. On one hand, such a sight might give him some macabre sense of closure. On the other, Rick didn't get the chance to finish his thought. Another one had bulldozed its way into his head, bullying the other one to the back of his mind. The new thought was, Jesus Christ. He was close enough to touch Melanie's body now. Her throat had lolled back unnaturally, and the open gash in the front of it made her look like a human Pez dispenser. Her skin was black and blue, frostbitten from the cold, but her face was still intact, even more so than he had expected it to be. She was not missing an ear, nor was she missing an eye. She was, however, missing the eight-and-a-half-month-old fetus that had been gestating in her uterus when Rick sawed her throat in half earlier that week. The jacket Melanie was wearing had been torn to shreds. Her sweater underneath was but a web of tatters, cotton ribbons. Melanie's swollen stomach splayed open as as if a hand grenade had went off inside it. Felix had not been the one to dissect her. It would have been impossible for a house cat to do such a thing, no. Some other animal had gotten to Rick's wife. Wolves or coyotes, he assumed. The baby she was carrying was gone, most likely dragged off and devoured by the scavengers of the forest. Rick then came to the realization that the body parts he found in his patio had belonged to his unborn son, and not his wife. He had green eyes. Just like Melanie. The words cemented themselves in his mind. Rick doubled over and began to heave. There was no spaghetti dinner this time. He had given it all to the monster beneath the kitchen sink. The only thing that came out was Pepto-Bismol. It tasted the same going up as it did going down and it turned the snow at his feet, bright pink. The baby was the reason he killed his wife. During the last couple of years of their marriage, Rick had grown to hate Melanie. He was working up the nerve to leave her before she announced her pregnancy to him. It came as a terrible surprise. Melanie was supposed to be on birth control at the time. She told him the child had been a gift from God which Rick found strange since he had never known her to be the religious type. He suspected she secretly stopped taking her pill. Rick urged her to get an abortion, but she had made up her mind. She would be having their baby, with or without his blessing. This was yet another matter Melanie had put her foot down on. <laughs> 
And so, just like with the cat, Rick had caved, and together the two built a crib, converted his office into a nursery, and did all the other things young couples do when they're expecting their first child. According to their obstetrician, their baby would be a boy, and they could expect him to be born late in the month of December. Could be a Christmas baby, their doctor had said to them. Shortly after that was when the crazy thoughts began flooding Rick's head. Eight and a half months later was when they finally went away. All it took was a rusty old handsaw and a few buckets of blood on a cold winter afternoon. There was nothing left for him to see. Rick wiped the remaining pink slime from his mouth and started his short hike back towards the house. The birds overhead were still whistling their tunes, but now they sung of a baby. Ripped from his dead mother's womb and torn to shred by hungry wild animals. Rick felt like his brains had been scrambled after seeing what had happened to his unborn son. He wondered if the baby was still alive while it was being eaten then decided he'd rather not know the answer to that, and pondered other questions instead. Was anything left of his little son's corpse out there, hidden under the white sheet of icy slush that blanketed the forest floor? Bones, perhaps. There must have been something. Otherwise, a powerful sense of guilt swept over him. Melanie might have been a bitch, but his son didn't deserve to die before he was ever truly born. The trees were silent evergreen specters, rising out of snowy earth. They stopped abruptly twenty yards from Rick's home, circling carefully around it as if they were afraid to root themselves in the soil where Melanie's murder had taken place. Rick's journey had left him fatigued, more mentally taxed than physically exhausted, but still If he felt like he needed to rest, to lay his head down, to close his eyes, he aimed to do all these things as soon as he got inside the house. His backyard was an icy desert in the middle of a lush green paradise. He lumbered through the last of the trees and across the inverted oasis. The slush beneath his feet seemed tainted. It looked gray and hoary like an ashtray, dead even if it was possible for snow to appear that way. He halted suddenly when the toe of his boot kicked something hard and rigid sticking out of the snow. It made a metallic clinking noise when his foot connected with it. Rick gazed down and saw the handsaw he had used to kill his wife staring up at him. Yet another reminder of his terrible crime. He bent down and pulled it free from the slush. He had not held it in his hand since that day. Its teeth were still stained red with Melanie's blood. The saw smiled at him like a satisfied glutton that had just enjoyed a big feast. Its grin was derisive. It mocked him. Rick spun around and flung the saw as hard as he could. He wasn't aiming for anywhere in particular. All he wanted was to make the damn thing go away. Just as he had done with the ear and the eye. The handsaw spun through the air like a boomerang, and for the briefest of moments, Rick was afraid that just like a boomerang, it might bend back around and make its way towards him again, grinning its red Cheshire cat grin. Sailing out of the yard and vanishing beyond the trees, Rick watched until it disappeared from sight, then turned back around and resumed his journey across the yard. He eyed his porch like the finish line at a marathon. It was eight below freezing outside. But somehow, Rick was sweating. He stumbled up the wooden steps and nearly fell flat on his face when his foot slipped on a patch of ice. Without so much as a thought, his hand reached out to grip the rail and he managed to catch himself before spilling onto the deck. He paused at the top of the steps to get his bearings. And it was here that he noticed them. Sitting nearly atop the doormat, like an uncooked cocktail sausage dipped in marinara sauce, The air rushed from his lungs so fast, they felt like they were going to collapse in on themselves. He was looking at a human finger. And this time, 
he was sure that it did not belong to his dead wife or his unborn son. The severed digit was too big to be a baby's and too masculine to have belonged to Melanie. It was thick and stubby and a little bit hairy. It had a cracked yellow nail at one end and at the other. It was bleeding onto his doormat. The sight of it evoked a strong sense of disgust in Rick. Worse than the other body parts he had found on his patio. Worse than the saw with the crimson grin. Worse even than his wife laying in the snow with her Pez dispenser neck and a belly like a lunar crater. Perhaps it was the uncertainty that revolted him so much. There were no tracks in the snow around his patio. Where had the finger come from? Who had it belonged to? Were there other bodies out in the woods? If so, how did they die? Rick darted towards the finger and snatched it off the doormat. He needed it off his deck. He reared his arm back and chucked it as hard as he could towards the trees. It twirled end over end through the air before spiking itself, nail side up, in the snow like a lawn dart a few feet from the place Melanie had taken her last desperate breaths. It hadn't made it to the forest like the handsaw had. Now the finger was sitting upright in the middle of his yard, like a miniature monument. Rick stared at it for a moment, contemplating whether or not to walk out across the slush and try again. He decided to let the finger stand in peace. It was supposed to snow later that afternoon. Fresh powder would have it covered up by the evening. He called out for Felix, but the cat did not appear when he shouted his name. Defeated, Rick withdrew back inside of his living room, then plopped himself down on the couch. He had only been awake for a couple of hours, but he was wiped. His eyelids were becoming heavy, and he could feel himself drifting to sleep. But before the dreams took over, his mind conjured up one more thought something he had not yet considered. The eyeball. The ear. And now the finger were all relatively fresh when he found them on the porch. The weather outside was below freezing. Exposure for only an hour at that kind of temperature would have been enough to freeze flesh solid. The way he remembered it. The eye had been squishy when he held it in his hand. The ear had been warm to the touch, and the finger was still bleeding when he came upon it. It was an utterly insane conclusion to draw, but this sudden epiphany could only mean the body parts he had been finding were being delivered to his porch just minutes before he arrived. Sleep was beginning to overpower him. But a final, groggy thought popped inside his head before he faded to black. And it would lead to a frightful dream during his nap. But he wouldn't remember any of it by the time he woke up. Someone else is out there. The first thing Rick expected to see when he woke up was the finger he had spiked into the snow, standing like a loyal Soviet soldier, guarding the entrance of an underground bunker somewhere along the Siberian tundra. The finger was still there. However, there was something else much more prominent that caught his attention first. A black, white, and blonde ball of fur was curled up at the patio door. Rick sprung to his feet at the sight of it. His cat was home. He zipped across the living room in a flash and jerked open the door in the same prefunctionary manner Kramer might have entered Jerry's apartment in Seinfeld. But the second he got a clear look at his kitty, he knew that something was very wrong. The black, white, and blonde ball of fur curled up at the patio door was actually a black, white, blonde, and red ball of fur. And it wasn't moving. Felix 
was dead. Just as dead as his wife, dead as the gray, ashy slush that kicked the ground in Rick's backyard. Felix's body was twisted and coiled as if someone had wrung him out like a wet towel. Blood oozed like strawberry syrup from his mouth and eyes. Rick wanted to cry, but couldn't. Maybe the snow had frozen his tear ducts. More than likely, it was the fear swelling inside him that had put a stop to the tears. He was no longer in denial. It hadn't been Felix or any other animal that was leaving body parts on his patio. He was indeed being stalked. Rick took off his glove and touched a hand to Felix's fur. His body was still warm. The cat had just been killed. It couldn't have been more than 20 minutes before he woke up. A bizarre sense of frustration swept through him. That bastard had gone too far. Rick's hands were quaking. He clenched his fists to regain control of them. He almost screamed out at the trees where he assumed his stalker was watching him, but he stopped himself. Rick had always been a level-headed guy and almost never let his anger get the better of him. That is, when he wasn't hearing voices telling him to kill his wife. Rick scooped the poor cat up off the porch and carried him out into the middle of the yard. It was here that he would dig Felix's grave. He grabbed a shovel from the tool shed and went to work. The finger stood a few feet away from the plot as Rick began to dig, the sole mourner at the unfortunate kitty's funeral. The digging was more for Rick than it was for Felix. He always had an easier time thinking when he was doing some kind of yard work. His stalker was no doubt watching him while he buried his cat. Rick didn't know why he was being tormented. He suspected it was some perverted form of payback for what he did to his wife. He thought of Melanie again. Then... Oh God, the baby. Maybe it wasn't animals at all that removed his son from her stomach. Maybe it had been the stalker. Yes, that was it. The freak had removed Rick's son from his dead wife's stomach before he died inside her. And now, for whatever reason, he was trying to drive Rick mad. The only thing he couldn't place was where the body parts had been coming from. It didn't matter. He knew now what he had to do. If his son was alive, he was going to rescue him from whoever this sicko was. After that, he would call the police. The baby would most likely be handed over to Melanie's mother while Rick was in prison. She was well-to-do, and not that old. The boy would have a good life. It wouldn't absolve Rick of his sins, but at least he could do something good with his last few hours as a free man. Rick scooped the last bit of dirt on top of Felix's grave and patted it down with the back of his shovel. He tossed it to the ground and whirled around to face the trees. They didn't look like silent specters anymore. He felt like the captain of a ship and his crew of tall wooden giants had just surrounded him after declaring mutiny. I know you're out there, Rick said. There was an air of false bravado in his voice. Deep down, he was terrified. He pointed to the living room. I'll be waiting right there, on my couch. If you have any balls, you'll bring my son. We could finish this. I'm not moving from that spot until we do. And with that... Rick marched inside and prepared for war. Rick Collum had never been to war before. If one were to overlook the Melanie incident, he hadn't been in a fight since the seventh grade, when an older boy named Tommy Harper punched him in the gut for spilling the contents of his lunch tray all over the eighth grader's brand new Denver Broncos football jersey after Rick tripped over a backpack in the school cafeteria. Rick had seen movies about war before. He went through a phase in college where he was really into old Vietnam movies. He and his roommate had even gotten high on Friday night and watched Apocalypse Now three times in a row. But this was not Vietnam or Cambodia. 
and he was not Captain Ben Willard or Colonel Kurtz, or even crazy-ass Colonel Kilgore. And he did not love the smell of napalm in the morning. In fact, he didn't even know what napalm smelled like. His home wasn't a conventional military stronghold. There was a fire burning in the fireplace, and his television was tuned to a holiday music station that was currently playing through a Bing Crosby Christmas album. He was sitting in a pistachio green leather sofa, and in his lap was a fire poker that he used to jab kindling when it needed help catching. It was his M1 carbine. Rick had no real gun. Melanie had never let him own a firearm, and he had no military training outside of what he had seen in old movies. But he readied himself, and waited just the same. Charlie was hiding out somewhere in the woods, and he needed to stay alert. The sun had gone down hours ago, and now, and snow was falling so heavy that he could barely see the trees across the yard. A few inches must have already come down because the finger was finally buried, out of sight, but not out of mind. He felt like he had been sitting on the couch listening to holiday crooners forever. Rick began to wonder if his stalker would ever show, and for a second, he even doubted his sanity. Maybe his cranked mind had never really mended itself, and everything he'd been experiencing was one big, psychotic episode. That theory didn't last too long, though. It melted away like a dead man's presence in a world that's ever moving always forgetting. He was sane, all right. Rick saw it appear in the darkness. His eyes could just barely make it out. But there was definitely something outside. Or someone, rather, standing at the edge of his yard, where the tree line began. The figure of a man. The man stood statuesque, as if completely oblivious to the snowstorm that was rolling in. Rick squinted, trying to make out his features, but the yard was dark, and the figure was just a black silhouette against a white backdrop. There was no denying what he was seeing. His stalker had arrived. Rick leaned forward in his seat, gripping the brass handle of the fireplace poker tight. He tried to swallow, but his mouth was dry. There was something off about the man's figure. It gave him a bad vibe. The man had an object in his hand, but Rick couldn't tell what it was. Something appeared to be dangling from his torso. Perhaps a rope of some kind. It reached all the way to the ground, and there was no sign of the baby. Rick's heart sank a little in his chest. He had been so certain the stalker would show up with his child. The figure began to move across the yard, and as it did, its shape grew larger and clearer. By the time the stalker reached Felix's grave, he could tell he was dealing with a very large man. From the look of it, the figure was easily six foot five and over 250 pounds. He had a body that would dwarf Rick's much smaller frame. Closer, the big man advanced and his features began to take shape. Rick could now see that his pursuer wasn't wearing any clothes. It was both ridiculous and terrifying to see the massive naked man striding through the snow towards his house. In his hand, was the saw Rick had flung into the woods earlier that day. The damn thing was still grinning red. Bill Crosby's smooth baritone voice was flowing out of the television speakers. He was singing of sleigh bells and treetops and snow. The song was White Christmas. The giant naked man was standing at the base of the patio steps and now his features were as clear as day. The sight made Rick stand up involuntarily. He knew where the man had been getting the body parts. Himself, 
One of his eyes appeared to be missing from his face, and it looked as if his ear had been torn off the side of his head. Yet the most maddening thing about the man's face was how hauntingly familiar it was. Rick was sure he had never met this man before. There was no way he would have forgotten him if he had, but he knew his face. Somehow, he knew it. The man stomped up the porch's wooden steps, his footsteps rattling the deck. He was built like an NFL linebacker, tall, wide, and sturdy, his big muscles hidden by a generous layer of fat. He reached the top of the deck and Rick lowered his poker towards him as if he were an Aztec warrior wielding a spear. The glass patio door was the only thing separating the two. There was still something hanging from the man's torso. It dragged across the deck as he moved towards the door. It was not a rope as Rick had originally thought, no. It was pink and fleshy, and it protruded from the man's doughy stomach like a growth. Wait. Rick couldn't believe what he was seeing. Was that an... There was no more time to finish his thought. The patio door swung open, in rushed a gust of icy air, but the cold was not the only thing that entered Rick's living room. His stalker was now only a few feet away from him. Rick jabbed at him with the poker, but the hulking man knocked it away effortlessly, and it fell to the floor. With one hand, he shoved Rick down to the sofa. Rick looked up at him, and suddenly knew why that face was so familiar. It was his face, and Melanie's face too. An amalgam of the two of them. The man had Rick's nose and his dead wife's lips. His one remaining eye was the same color as hers, but damned if he didn't have Rick's chin. He glanced again at that fleshy rope hanging from his attacker's stomach right where his belly button should be. A rope that had once been connected to Melanie's womb. And so he understood. The stalker had brought his son after all. The man wrapped a four-fingered hand around Rick's face and scowled at him. Rick was sure he would have cursed him if he could talk, but unborn babies don't know how to speak the English language. A few days ago, his son had been in Melanie's belly. Now he was a massive man with a mutilated face that was about to punish his father for selfishly ending his life before it had a chance to begin. He raised the saw to Rick's neck. Rick didn't feel the need to question how what was happening was even possible. His mind was sound, but thinking about the ins and outs of what he was seeing might have caused it to crack again, and he didn't want to die a madman. The teeth of the saw felt cold against his throat. The grinning glutton was ready to feast again. And feast. It would. Bing Crosby's Christmas album was still playing on the TV. The famous crooner's soothing voice blending seamlessly in the air with Rick's screams. He sang of calling pipes and mountain signs of beautiful summer meadows and bleeding throats. <laughs>